and we now move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. Can I advise members that questions 6, 9 and 12 have been withdrawn? I call Mr David Hildage. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm, and I'm asking question one. Can I also apologise for my absence earlier due to three committees going on at the same time, unfortunately, but question one. And I would uh, call Mrs Judith Cochran to answer question one on behalf of the Assembly Commission. Uh, thank you, and I thank the member for their question. Uh, the member will be aware that in the recently completed roof project, the Assembly Commission took the opportunity to refurbish or replace all of the existing roof-mounted mechanical and electrical services, and where appropriate, to incorporate renewable technologies in the scheme, uh, specifically photovoltaic or PV panels, rainwater harvesting and solar thermal tubes. Electricity generated by the PV panels is now being used to supplement the building's energy supply and some of the hot water supply is provided by means of the solar uh, thermal power. It was anticipated that these improvements would reduce the building's energy consumption by a minimum of 25% and early indications illustrate that savings in excess of that figure have been achieved to date. Other energy saving initiatives have, been, have also included the introduction of motion sensor lighting the replacement of light bulbs in the building with more energy efficient LED bulbs, the rerouting of pipes and cables for more efficient use, and the installation of mains timer sockets where appropriate. The current display energy certificate for the building gives us a D rating, and the score has improved from 97 last year to 89 this year, which is an excellent achievement for a building of this nature. And the Commission will continue to explore all practical means to increase the energy efficiency of the building. I call David Hildage. Speaker, I wish the, the member uh, well. As I understand she is not attempting to return uh, to any future mandate, so I wish all the best for the future. Uh, as a follow up, can I ask. Member direct his microphone, we're not picking up. Sorry. Can I ask then, in a follow up, uh, can the uh, Commission ensure that a much better controlled and efficient heating system is in place for future mandates, as it has been uh, sort of a controversial one here with sometimes too much heat? Well, I'll not comment about hot air, but um, the, the, the roof um, pr uh, project incorporated and upgraded a building management system which controls the heating throughout the building. Staff monitor the heating uh, at set points across the building and adjust these when necessary. This system combined with new boilers and sustainable development um, in, in the roof itself have reduced the overall energy consumption by 30%. If the member has a specific uh, issue uh, with, his, with his own office and doesn't want to have to continue to wear his thermal vest in the winter and his string vest in the summer, um, I'm sure if he speaks to relevant building control um, staff, um, they will be able to assist. Well done. Well done. Uh, I call Oliver McMullen. I get to ask a colleague. And, uh, over in this, this last mandate, many visitors and, and indeed members here have commented on the heat uh, as the member has brought up, the heat uh, not only in the building but also in the offices. Can we get the cost of the heat of this building uh, per year in the last mandate? For him? Um, thank the member for his question. I, I wouldn't have those exact figures in front of me, although I have said that the, the costs have come down um, by 30 per cent, but I'm sure I could provide um, that information to you. Moving on, I call Andy Allen. Rabbi Schwiger, question two, please. The question will be answered by Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member for his question. The member will be aware that in the recently completed – sorry, I am on the wrong question, apologies uh, – the Assembly Commission is determined to make Parliament buildings accessible to all, and strenuous efforts have been made over a number of years to improve access for people with disabilities. On the ground floor of the building, a changing places facility was installed in 2011, which provides fully accessible toilet facilities for people with profound disabilities. Parliament Buildings is one of the few public buildings to have such a facility. In the summer of 2012, the Commission installed front ramped access to Parliament Buildings to ensure that all visitors are able to gain access via the primary entrance to the building. 
Parking for people with disabilities is provided in the east and west upper car park adjacent to the building, and we have recently increased the number of spaces available. The Assembly Commission also holds the Louder Than Words Charter Mark, which demonstrates its commitment to improve access and services to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And in November 2012, the Commission became the first ever organisation to receive the National Autistic Society Autism Access Award. Minor physical alterations have recently been made to the reception areas in the business office and stationary office to improve access for wheelchair users, users and changes are proposed in the members' bar in the near future. The Commission has also recently approved a programme of works that will include improvements to the existing lifts and to access from lower to ground floor and ground floor level, particularly for people with physical disabilities. Further improvements include Automatic opening corridor doors are also planned. I call Andy Allen. Thank the member for her answers. And whilst I would like to place on record my utmost thanks to the Commission and all those involved in behind the scenes in addressing the accessibility and facility um, deficiencies in the building, I would like to ask the member if the Commission has implemented any regular monitoring of. Uh, access services and facilities to make sure they are as up-to-date as possible, because it was only when I came into this building that we recognised that there was a number of these deficiencies. Can I thank the member as supplementary? And the member is absolutely right. Up until he did come into this building, we, uh, I would say, had the bare minimum of what was required, and it was only through him being here and the advice that he has given, which has been invaluable to the Commission, I have to say, of the access around the building for him, that there have been massive strides made to make this place uh, more uh, disability friendly and, and more accessible. Um, we as a commission and the future commission, as that may, whatever that may look like and who might be on that, um, have made a, a, a commitment to keep this under, under our power to keep looking at this issue because we know there are still a lot of things that we could do um, and a lot of things that we have had debated in the Commission um, have been based, I have to admit, on finances as well. But I know that the member has been happy to date with the, 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 the actions that have been put in place and I thank him on behalf of the Commission for all of his help. I call George Robinson. <coughs> Deputy Speaker. Uh, could, I, could I ask the member to clarify if there's a first aid station within the building? Uh, I thank the member for his question. Um, from memory of having to use it once, uh, we do have a first aid room within the building which is based up on the second floor. Um, you will notice all around the building as well there will be signs up to do with first aiders that are available within this building who are trained in first aid. And uh, from memory again, I believe we have at least five de defibrillators within the building um, stationed on, on, on most floors and people are trained in those also. I call Fergal McKinney. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank Mr Allen for his question and the Commission for its answers, which rightly uh, underscores the need for proper provision. But is there any consideration being given to those who may not be disabled but who could have conditions which somehow restrict their movement or ability to access the building, particularly given the long distances that they have to park away from the building uh, when they come here? I thank the member for his question and again uh, as part of, of the overall um, restructuring and looking at disabled access within the building. There have been extra parking spaces provided um, at the east and west doors, though I do understand that there is, uh, there is a long way to walk within this building. I don't know how we can overcome that. Um, I don't know, uh, you know whether we can get parking. We can't get it at the front door, uh, albeit if we could, we would do that. Um, we may have to look at the back door at the slope of possibility, or maybe there has been uh, disabled parking uh, bays put out and some of the new parking bays out the back. So yeah, it's something that we will continually look at. It's something that as members of the Commission is fed back by members of our own party that bring the issues forward and uh, it, it, it was something that will be kept on the agenda um, because it certainly is, has been a very difficult building to access over the years. I call Kieran McCarthy. And I thank the member for her re response, um, and particularly the provision of the changing places in this building. Uh, I can speak from personal experience that not is vital uh, whenever it comes to uh, personal hygiene, etc., etc. But could I ask the member 
does she or does the Commission advertise or alert people to that provision being here because it could mean the difference of people coming or people not coming? I thank the member for his question, which is a very good question and one that I'm unable to answer as a Commission member, but I can answer it from a personal level as well. Um, I had a, a year ago a visitor in the building who was paralysed from the neck down and required changing facilities, and I was unaware. I wasn't a Commission member at the time, but I was unaware that we did have the, that changing places room down there, and I had offered my own office for, for, for his uh, carer. Um, to assist in his needs. So I think you're right, probably right, you're absolutely right. We do need to advertise that more, that we do have those facilities available here. Moving on, I call Robin Swan. Question number three. And question number three will be answered on behalf of the Commission by Judith Cochrane. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Um, due to budget cuts in recent years, the overall staffing of the Secretariat has reduced by some 60 staff. And to meet these cuts, the Commission undertook a business efficiency review programme back in 2012 and also ran a voluntary exit scheme in 2015. These have resulted in a decrease in the number of staff within the Usher Services business area. Natural wastage has also been a factor in this decrease. The head of Usher Services, in consultation with colleagues, has however realigned some functions in an attempt to sure, ensure that business demand continues to be met and so that there has been no impact upon members discharging their duties, nor restrictions placed upon public access to Parliament buildings. Uh, to date, um, as far as we're aware, this has been successful, but planning is underway uh, for staffing levels in the new financial year and to establish how best any vacancies might be filled. I call Robin Swan. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Commission member for her answer. But could I draw just to her attention in any staffing review that does take place? There has been, I've had a number of members complain to me that when they were going to attend events and publicity events down on the apron, that the gate within the, the fence has actually been locked and closed, and that members were actually then unable to attend the, the activity that was on the other side of the fence. I myself was able to climb it, unlike some of the other ones, but it's not something I would advise, I can assure you. Um, I, I thank the member um, for his questions. It's an interesting point, and I'll certainly take that back to um, the relevant um, director to raise with the head of Usher Services, as obviously we wouldn't want to curtail uh, any member from being able um, to go down there, and we don't really want to see you hurdling the gates either. Um, but we do um, also have to maintain that balance um, of uh, having the gate locked for security reasons as well. So, yes, it's something that I will take back. Moving on, I call David McElveen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number four, please. And question number four will be answered by uh, Ms. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the member uh, for his question. While the Assembly Commission does not make any public comment on personal matters, and especially when those matters are, are ongoing, I can confirm that one member of the Assembly Commission staff is currently suspended as part of a disciplinary process involving the alleged misuse of the Commission's um, social media policy. I can also confirm that following appropriate investigations under the Commission's disciplinary uh, procedures, three members of staff have been disciplined in respect to breaches of social media policy. I call David McElveen for supplementary. <coughs> thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do thank the member uh, for her, her answer. And I do, of course, appreciate that when we're dealing with personnel, that there should be confidentiality. And I, I completely appreciate that. However, in a general sense, I wonder could the member assure me and the House that there has been even-handedness in the way in which uh, this matter has been dealt with and that um, original thought within social media uh, and the use of social media would not be viewed upon in the same way as retweeting or reusing somebody else's quotations um, because obviously those two things would in the real world be viewed upon in two very different scenarios. Uh, can I thank the member for a supplementary? Um, Social media policy was introduced to, in 2014 uh, to the Secretariat staff and they were provided with training in relation to the policy. And that policy uh, it covers the acceptable use of social media by staff engaged by the Commission and has the particular focus on, uh, to maintain the standards of behaviour from all staff uh, and I cannot call into question their impartiality. And I think like, under, under the guidance of uh, the training that has been provided, I think it covered a lot. Um, for all members of staff, and including uh, MLAs uh, uh, as well, members in this building. Thank you. 
I call Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her answers. Um, can you advise have uh, Commission staff involved in this had any opportunity to appeal um, the uh, judgment made about their activity on social media? And can I thank the member for her question? Yes, the disciplinary uh, policy included an appeal mechanism uh, that fully complies with all legislative requirements and is, is currently in process. I call Jim Allister. Is it not wholly shameful? that a commission which turns a blind eye to the ripping off of hundreds of thousands of pounds by a bogus research company then seeks to make an example of easy targets like security staff who apparently retweet some comments by political journalists. Is that not wholly disproportionate? And is it not time that those staff were relieved of the pressure which has been put on them by the austere approach taken in this matter. Uh, can I thank the member for his answer? And it would be wholly uh, inappropriate for me to discuss sensitive information in relation to an ongoing personnel matter. I call Sandra Overend. Question five, please. And question five will be answered by Mr. Sam Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I thank Mrs. Overend for her question. The Assembly Commission recognises the problems experienced by Parliament building uh, users with regard to car parking. And the Commission is aware that some users of Parliament buildings have experienced difficulty in parking on busier days. Facilities Directorate have, however, been able to ease the pressure on parking by some physically realignment and staffing of the Lower East car park, and by virtue of the provision of the overall bill. Uh, the, the overspill car park that came into uh, service in 2011. These measures provided the Assembly with an additional 40 car parking spaces, and this has well been well received by many car park users. A further 35 parking spaces, which includes two spaces for charging of an electrical uh, vehicles, are also now available. Uh, for the upper car park users at the rear of Parliament buildings. Assembly senior management has already been involved in discussions with DFP to look at the possibility of obtaining further car parking provisions for users of Parliament buildings. Unfortunately, at this time, DFP report that there is little prospect of obtaining further spaces for car parking within the Stormont estate. However, Facilities management will continue to monitor the situation. I call Sandra over in for supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Commissioner for that response. Uh, indeed, the 40 additional places uh, was welcome, but that, that is now four years ago. Uh, so it's clear that more, more action is needed um, for members of organisations, by members of the public who are coming to meet with MLAs uh, and staff within the building. Um, does he agree with me that it's rather unacceptable that those people coming to visit uh, MLAs and staff have so little uh, spaces and have to park so far away? I thank Mrs. Overend for her further comments, and indeed uh, I do support her, her sentiments, but I thank the member for a supplementary question. The Commission is aware of the ongoing and often serious parking difficulties of par Parliament buildings. I hope the next Commission will identify this as an area for consideration with all speed, and I hope that's acceptable to Mrs. Townsend. Over and over. As indicated earlier, uh, question six has been withdrawn, so I call Alban McGuinness. Question number seven will be answered by Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Um, can I thank the member um, for his question? And in my own personal opinion, uh, on this his last question time, can I pay a tribute uh, to Mr. McGuinness? And in true uh, typical Alban fashion, he continues to be, concern, uh, be concerned for the running of this assembly and to the members inside it right up to the last minute. Um, politics is a profession rather than a vocation, and continuing professional development is as important in political life as it is in any other profession. There it will be important for members um, newly elected to the Assembly in May 2016 to be provided with the appropriate induction to the business of this Assembly and also be provided with ongoing professional development to support them in their role as a public representative and legislators. 
Supported by the Assembly Commission, Politics Plus is currently developing a new member induction programme, which will be implemented following the election in May, and will focus on the role of the MLA in representing the interest of the electorate and scrutinising the work of the executive. Whilst this induction programme has been designed for new members, returning members are also free to participate as they require. The induction programme to be delivered by Politics Plus will supplement that already provided by the Business Office on the procedures of the Assembly, including standing orders, and by the Bill Office on the legislative process. New members will also receive induction support from the Assembly's Information Services, Financial and Legal Service Offices, as well as other offices of the Assembly as appropriate. I call Owen McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and, and could I thank uh, uh, the uh, representative of the Commission for her kind words. Um, I have enjoyed working with Karen McKevitt and indeed with the Commission. Uh, could I further ask uh, the uh, Commissioner, in relation to the programme, uh, would there be an emphasis on dealing with legislation and dealing with draft legislation in particular, because I think it's a process which needs uh, considerable skill and knowledge. I would just ask if that were available. I can thank the member for his supplementary question. And the induction programme provided will cover a wide range of areas, including strategic planning, ethical leadership, speech delivery, dealing with difficult conversations and conflict resolutions, effective committee um, scrutiny, role of the committee chair, analysing complex information, working with the media using social media, crisis management, managing reputa reputational risk and the members' code of conduct. Members attending this induction programme will also receive briefings from employment law specialists from the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the Northern Ireland uh, Ombudsman. And I have to say that if members have any further um, ideas that uh, Commission members can bring to the politics programme, uh, uh, our doors are open and we would only uh, be too willing uh, before the end of this mandate to include them, uh, any information required uh, or what they would like to include in this programme. Thank you. And I call Thomas Buchanan. Number eight, uh, Speaker. And question number eight will be answered on behalf of the Commission by Mr Sam Gardner. I thank Mr Buchanan for his question. Between May 2011 and the present, uh, 36 school groups from West Tyrone constituency, with 900 participants, have availed of the Assembly's Educational Service Programme through visiting Parliament Building. At that same time period, the Assembly's Education Service has delivered outreach programmes to six groups within the West Tyrone constituency, involving a total of 768 participants. The Educational Service also facilitates Let's Talk events in each constituency on a regular basis. These events afford an opportunity for older school pupils to question and debate with local politicians at constituency level. You'll be pleased at that. <laughs> All post-primary schools within a constituency are invited. One such event has been held in the West Tyrone constituency in each of the last three years, with an average of 34 pupils attending each event. Six of the 11 post-primary schools in the area have participated in at least one event. I call Thomas Buchanan. Thank the member for his response and for uh, outlining the number of uh, events that have taken place within the West Tyrone constituency. On the feedback received by the Commission, can the, 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 the member outline the benefit that the schools have found these events to have been uh, for their pupils? Your supplementary. The main Assembly website and the, and the dedicated Education Service website contains all the relevant information for groups wishing to take part in the educational programme in Parliament buildings. The Education Service also has a, a specific Twitter feed to raise awareness of the service. Uh, question 9 has been withdrawn, so I call Paul Given. Question number 10. And question number 10 will be answered by Ms. Mrs. Judith Cochrane on behalf of the Commission. 
Uh, I thank the member uh, for his question. Uh, it's anticipated that the reduction in the number of executive departments from 12 to 9 will result in an equivalent reduction in the number of statutory committees. As a result, the committee staff complement will be reduced by nine staff. In addition, the research and information services staff complement has been reduced by three, and the staff complement in the official report has been reduced by two staff. Call Paul Given. Deputy Speaker, as we welcome the reduction in the number of departments and uh, future election reduction in MLAs as well, um, how much money can we anticipate that these reductions will save the taxpayer that has to fund this institution? Well, I thank the member um, for his uh, supplementary question. Um, and the, the savings that I will be referring to are specifically here um, in this building. Um, but until the new staffing structures have been finalised, it's not, um, I can't give you a completely accurate um, figure. Um, however, the release of staff across the Assembly under the voluntary exit scheme will save more than £800,000 per year. And the reduction in complement arising from the changes in the number of committees um, has facilitated a significant proportion of these savings. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, may I ask the, the Commission representative, in respect of the reduction in the number of staff, uh, for, to, re, to reflect the reduction in the number of committees in the Assembly, can, can the Commission indicate that they, are, that they have taken into account that the remit um, and depth of the work of those committees will be substantially more than, that, than any of the existing committees? Uh, and, uh, while there is to be a reduction in staff, can we be assured that that reduction will reflect the additional work that those committees will have to do? Well, um, I, I thank the, the member um, for uh, his question. And whilst every effort will be made to ensure that there is appropriate support for all committees, the reduction in the staffing complement uh, that we have already um, started to progress means there will be limited opportunity uh, to take further account of the increased remit of a number of the new statutory committees. But of course, uh, the Commission itself regularly uh, reviews the, the services um, that we provide, and I am sure that the new Commission uh, going forward will keep this uh, under review and uh, will reassess our budgetary priorities, because um, I'm sure that the um, important scrutiny work um, of the committees um, will not be overlooked. And I call Paul Gervin. Number 11, Mr. Speaker. And question number 11 will be answered on behalf of the Commission by Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, and can I thank the member for his question. At its meeting on the 11th of November 2014, the Assembly Commission agreed the policy for the external lighting of Parliament buildings in order to manage the, the use of the system while preserving the dignity of Parliament buildings. In line with the policy, the Commission scheduled up to four days during the calendar year for events of its choice. In 2016, the four days chosen by the Assembly are Monday the 8th of March, International Women's Day when it's lit up purple, Thursday the 17th of March, St Patrick's Day when it be lit up green, Tuesday the 12th of July when it would be lit up orange, and Friday the 11th of November uh, when Remembrance Day when it would be lit up red. The Assembly Charity of the Year for 2016 Positive Futures is also allowed five days during its 12-month term. Also to date in 2016, no additional requests have been granted in relation to the other eight days scheduled for events in support of charitable, community and non-profit organisations during the calendar year. Such requests will be considered by the Commission as and when they are received. And I call Paul Gervin for supplementary. Thank the member for for her answer in relation to uh, the lighting up of the building. Uh, the reason for putting in the question was there is a fear that it could be used by others to uh, actually use a political statement, and that was part of the reason why I asked the question. And I do appreciate that. Is there a, is there a criteria uh, set down in relation to ensure that it is for charitable events as well, such as uh, autism and, and organisations such as that? Thank the member for his uh, supplementary. And can I say, in line with the policy, only events organised at Parliament buildings or within the Stormont estate, which are DFP approved, will have access to the lighting system. Only charitable, community, or non profit organisations based in or having significant connection to Northern Ireland also celebrating a significant anniversary, for example, 1st, 5th, 10th, 25th, etc., or occasion may be permitted to have Parliament buildings illuminated in their special colour. And I call Raymond McCartney. 
Uh, question number 13, please. Um, question number 13 will also be answered by Ms Paula Bradley. I thank the member for his question, and we've got to the end of question time. We've got them all in. Um, uh, can I, first of all, ask Mr Speaker if I could have an initial minute to answer this question? I thank the member for their question. It is an obvious fact that women are underrepresented in both political and public life. The evidence is there. We have too few female MLAs. We have woefully too few women on boards of public bodies, while at the same time we have men who sit on multiple boards. Returning to the question, in 2015, the Assembly Commission, through Politics Plus, established a Women in Politics programme. This programme was aimed at female elected representatives in order to provide support for the development of their political careers and particularly to encourage female councillors to put themselves forward for future elections and to build links between local and central government. It is anticipated that a second cohort of this programme will be commissioned in 2016-2017. A Young Female Leaders Academy was launched in October 2015. The purpose of the Academy is to create awareness of the added value that women bring to the public and political sphere. Through this initiative, the young women will learn about the opportunities that are available to them, particularly in political life, in terms of shaping policy and instigating positive change. The Speaker of the Assembly is also responsible for leading women, Assembly Women's Week. Assembly Women's Week was an initiative brought forward by the Speaker to only mark to only, not only mark International Women's Day 2016, but to also end the mandate of the Assembly with a positive focus on improving female representation in the Assembly and public life generally. In addition to the above programmes, in February this year, the Speaker established a reference group on a gender-sensitive Assembly to advise him and future Speakers on initiatives and programmes which enhance the role of women both in political and public life. The reference group includes MLAs from each of the five executive parties, as well as one representing the small par smaller parties and independent members. Most recently, the Assembly Women's Caucus was established and launched last week, and is a huge step forward in demonstrating our commitment to supporting women who enter politics. The members of the caucus will work together, irrespective of political party affiliation, to ensure that the political culture of the Assembly is more reflective of the gender balance in our wider society. The caucus will also provide an additional driving force to support and encourage more women to enter political life. This Assembly Commission is justifiably proud of the actions it has taken to encourage women into politics. <coughs> and that is the end of this, the final question time in this Assembly. Uh, could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments?